the punishment that's going to go with it. At any rate, there's certain laws that apply here to the maximum times juveniles can spend in prison here. So I think without getting too technical, 30 months is about the maximum time that this child can spend in prison. He was treated and remanded to Connecticut Juvenile Marshal's custody and was being housed in Hartford. His current location is not public, and the state of Connecticut was reportedly having an issue determining where he should be held long term. Trent Lalima, one of the boy's attorneys, reminds the public that this is a juvenile matter, not a criminal matter, according to Connecticut law. As of new legislation which took effect in July 2018, the maximum punishment a juvenile offender under 14 can receive in Connecticut is 30 months of supervised probation, either in or out of a residential treatment facility. If the juvenile is deemed incompetent to comprehend the court proceedings or if a mental health diagnosis is made, they could be indefinitely committed to the state's juvenile psychiatric center. This center, called Solnit South, could also come into play following the completion of the offender's sentence should mental health treatment become necessary, as they could be housed there until the age of 20. The Hartford Current reports that the Solnit South campus had six attempted suicides by residents between November 2017 and March 2018. It seems they've got issues of their own over there. Bridget Curtin's twin is one of the youngest murder suspects in Connecticut's history. Under current law, he is ineligible to be tried as an adult because he is under 16 years of age. His case will be heard entirely in the juvenile system and will be sealed. Part 4 Guilt As the new year dawned, people put away their Christmas decorations and unfurled resolutions. An unfathomable double tragedy rocked the Atlanta suburb of Lawrenceville. On the afternoon of December 31, 2018, A handful of teens crowded into a makeshift shed behind a home in the 1800 block of River Landing Circle. 15-year-old Devin Hodges had gathered there with 17-year-old Chad Carlos and two other friends. Snapchat images showed the two taking turns being photographed brandishing a handgun. Just moments after those snaps were disseminated, the gun that 15-year-old Devin was holding was fired striking one of his friends. Tragically, Chad was sitting next to Devin and was struck by the bullet. The three remaining boys in the shed fled, and Devin dialed 911. However, it was too late. 17-year-old Chad Carlos died from that gunshot wound before first responders could render aid. Upon their arrival, police noticed 15-year-old Devin Hodges, the alleged shooter, running back and forth between two residences. Out of nowhere, another gunshot was heard. As units were responding to the scene, they heard another gunshot where they located another male deceased from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. They think the initial shooting was an accident. Devin, presumably consumed with guilt and regret, had stopped in a random backyard and taken his own life. After investigating the origin of the weapon, police determined that it had been stolen the day before, about a half mile from the crime scene. We're told the gun that killed them had been stolen the day before. Investigators say the gun was taken during a car break-in outside a home on Colville, Oak Lane. Authorities hadn't said who they think stole it or how exactly it made its way into Devin's hands. On December 30th, a man reported parking outside his son's mother's home on Colville Oak Lane around 5.45 p.m. Apparently, he left the vehicle unlocked and came out again at about 6.30 p.m. He could see that the passenger side door to his vehicle was open. A flashlight was on the seat. His glove box was open and his gun's holster was on the ground. The gun wasn't in it. The serial number on the 9mm he provided police matched that of the gun used to cut both Chad and Devin's lives short. According to statistics compiled by the gun control advocacy group Everytown, there were at least 204 unintentional shootings by children in 2018. Part 5 Joyride 
The day after Chad Carlos and Devin Hodges' tragic shooting deaths, a horrific New Year's Day is unfolding for several families near Houston. Around 2 p.m. on January 1, 2019, an unidentified 14-year-old boy stole the keys to the family's GMC Acadia SUV from the spot where his mother had hidden them. He and two other teens went joyriding, throwing eggs at pedestrians and other vehicles as they drove around illegally. Near the intersection of Russ Road and Aldine Mail Route Road, the teens lobbed an egg at 48-year-old Christopher Lopez's vintage Lincoln Continental. In return, he brandished a handgun and opened fire on the teens as they sped away, reaching speeds of over 60 miles per hour. Lopez gave chase. He actually went after the kids. As they approached one intersection, the teens plowed through a red light at 60 miles per hour and T-boned a Ford F-150 pickup truck just beginning to inch past the crosswalk. Both the SUV driven by the teens and the truck they hit rolled into the ditch by the roadside in a surreal puff of smoke. Surveillance video from surrounding businesses show the impact and its aftermath from varying angles. The driver of the truck showed no signs of life upon being extricated and was identified as 45-year-old Sylvia Zavala. Sylvia had driven to Houston from McAllen, Texas to celebrate the New Year with her family. A single mother, she had worked tirelessly to raise her two children, now 20 and 22. She was grandmother to four as well. That afternoon, she was doing some last-minute shopping before starting her long drive home. Just as her family began to get concerned when they couldn't reach her on her cell phone, a niece saw a news update on Facebook, an accident with a red truck that was frighteningly similar to her beloved Aunt Sylvia's. Sylvia's daughter Jessica and a nephew raced to the scene of the accident and their deepest fear was realized. Sylvia was gone. The camera footage clearly showed the teens being pursued by Christopher Lopez. Investigators estimated that he reached speeds of 100 miles per hour. Witnesses reported that he ran a second red light as he sped away from the scene. Once investigators arrived, they found two of the teens had non-life-threatening injuries. The driver had broken his ankle. The third uninjured teen filled police in on the events leading up to the accident. The driver was arrested and charged as a juvenile with felony murder. His family has received death threats. His mother had this to say, I'm a mother, please have mercy. He's 14 years old, he's a kid. He grabbed the keys without my permission. I was at church. They're kids. They were doing bad things, but an adult started chasing them and he had a gun. My son got scared and he ran. He was driving fast for his life, said the mother. That man is free, but they're treating my kid like he provoked the accident. My son is not a bad kid. He studies. He goes to church, the mother said. I understand when you lose somebody, it hurts. I've been through it. I'm asking for forgiveness from the family that's hurting. I really mean it. I'm a mom. He's only 14 years old. Where's the law to protect my son? The law is supposed to start when you're older. Police knew who the driver of the Lincoln was and set out to bring him in. Christopher Lopez finally turned himself in on January 14th and his bond hearing was held the next day. At the hearing, prosecutors said that, had Lopez not escalated a juvenile prank, Sylvia Zavala would still be alive. He pulled out a firearm, he fired shots at these kids, he chased them, getting to speeds of 100 miles an hour, he ran red lights with these kids. He is directly responsible for this woman dying. He was indicted and charged with three felonies, manslaughter, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, along with failure to stop and render aid. At the request of his public defender, his bond was reduced from $70,000 to $60,000, the judge saying that although he had no previous criminal record in Texas, he is a flight risk since he was involved in a hit and run. Lopez bailed out but coincidentally was arrested again on January 18, 2019 on an unrelated charge. According to court documents, Lopez and members of the car club he founded in June, Lone Star Slabs, used their custom vehicles to block the freeway. 
A slab is apparently a custom vehicle specific to the Houston area. Lopez often used his 1971 Lincoln Continental in promotional material for his group. It seems that on December 2, 2018, Lone Star Slab members parked beneath Houston's iconic Be Somebody graffiti on Interstate 45 in such a way that passing motorists could not get through. Several called police to report the disturbance and video footage and pictures were posted to multiple social media accounts. Lopez and other members of his group were charged with misdemeanor obstructing a roadway. He faces 20 years in prison for his role in the senseless death of Sylvia Zavala. Her 22-year-old son Juan Gaspar recalled how his mother raised he and his sister on her own and with little complaint. Following his mother's funeral on January 4, 2019, Juan said, My mother worked her whole life. She was so strong that she never showed us any signs of her problems. She raised my sister and me alone without complaining, and she was always there for us later when we grew up, always helping when we needed her. He said he was willing to pardon the 14-year-old driver because he remembers what it's like to be a 14-year-old. But at that age, he said, my mother knew what I was doing. I stole my mother's car a few times, but to go see my girlfriends, never to go and do harm to others like what those young men were doing, throwing eggs and vandalizing. My mother had a big, very forgiving heart. My mom had such a big heart that if she had been left alive in that accident, my mom would have pardoned that boy. I don't have a grudge or anything because my mother taught me that way. Softly, he says, I forgive that boy with my heart. He's a child, but he must have his punishment for having done this. My mom's life has a lot of value to us, and he's left the whole family with broken hearts. God put my mother on that path because she was alone in the car. What if they would have killed people with children in the whole family? It could have been worse when you think on a greater scale. The 14-year-old driver's felony murder case is being handled in juvenile court, so we will likely not find out the outcome of his case. I will update the Christopher Lopez case as developments arise. According to the Houston Chronicle, the Houston metropolitan area is the deadliest metro area in the country for drivers, passengers, and pedestrians, with about 640 citizens dying per year in roadway-related incidents. Part 6 Sisters On January 4, 2019, Deputies were called to a family home in the 1,000 block of Lawson Road in Magnolia, Mississippi. There, they found 32-year-old Erica Hall dead in the front of her half-acre lot, lying next to her car. She had been shot once in the chest and had multiple stab wounds in her upper torso. A knife was visible protruding from her back. Erica Hall was a mother of four who worked nights at the Sanderson Farms chicken processing plant near her home. According to Facebook, her 14-year-old daughter, Amariana Hall, had recently been attending school in New Orleans, where she played volleyball. For now, though, she and her 12-year-old sister were there in Mississippi staying with their mother and two other sisters aged 16 and 1. Their Aunt Robin did say that they had not been going to school and that Erica was working on alternative resources for them. Police were able to get a pretty clear story about how they came to be notified that there was a problem at the home. Jeremy, the neighbor across the road, told police that, around 11.40 p.m., 14-year-old Mariana and her 12-year-old sister tapped on his car window and asked if they could get a ride to Macomb because their grandmother had died. I got a tap on the window, and his two little girls, they told me that uh, they needed a ride to Macomb that grandmother had passed. Jeremy and his mother were skeptical. It was almost midnight on a Friday night, and besides that, they could clearly see Erica Hall's car across the road The lights were on inside. They attempted to phone her and received no answer and ultimately contacted her father and sister who lived just down the road. When those relatives arrive in their car, they all descend on the hall home and find Erica's lifeless body. A trail of blood is clearly visible coming down the steps of the home and into the yard, ending where she had taken her last breaths. 
We found on the other side of the car, laid out.